Wind tunnels are incredibly fascinating. They can generate wind speeds of 180 miles an hour, consume as much electricity as a small town, and cost up to 20 million pounds to build. I'm going to explain why these facilities are so expensive, how they're used in industries like cycling and Formula One, and also explain the intricate science behind their operation. £20 million to build what is effectively a large tube with a big fan at the end does seem pretty mind-blowing, but there's far more to it than that. Because wind tunnels have played a crucial role in history. From the development of aeroplane wings to creating race cars that seem to defy the laws of physics and helping cyclists to ride faster than ever before. Designers, engineers and manufacturers rely heavily on wind tunnels to develop products and components that are optimised for high speed and very specific applications. But the way in which wind tunnels are used now differs significantly from how they were used in the past. Before the days of computer-aided design and computational fluid dynamics to test digital designs and shapes, designers had to draw multiple versions of the parts or components by hand before manufacturing them, and they had absolutely no idea if the designs would even be effective without placing them in a wind tunnel for testing. This was a very slow process and very costly too because the number of units that were required for testing was high and the entire design concept could be a complete failure and all would be wasted. The modern process involves testing hundreds, maybe even thousands of designs using computer modelling that removes the need for physically manufacturing the parts before knowing if a certain design or concept is a successful one or not. At this stage, the wind tunnel is used more to validate designs by providing close to real world conditions. This helps to vastly reduce the costs, but also the time it takes to get a product from concept to final production version. And while modern wind tunnels are very high tech and packed full of sensors, this hasn't always been the case. The first ever wind tunnel was created by English inventor Francis Wenham in 1871. Wenham's tunnel used a 12 foot long section of tube that was just 18 inches wide and a fan at the end which was powered by a steam engine to blow air towards a scale model to test aeroplane wings at various speeds. By the 1900s there were wind tunnels located all around the world but they all had the same flaw and that was that they could only test small scale models and certain design concepts simply didn't translate into to full-scale ones that meant time, resource and money were wasted. The solution came from the US National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACAR for short, who authorised the construction of a full-scale wind tunnel to test full-sized aeroplanes. It measured 60 feet wide and 30 feet high and it paved the way for a number of different military aircraft and was used for over half a century to optimise and tune aircraft design. Wind tunnels do have some limitations and negatives to their use, such as they require incredibly accurate sensors and skilled personnel to operate them, gather data and then interpret that data into meaningful results. In addition to the limit on the size of parts that can be tested, they are also negatively affected by changing weather conditions and the airflow inside the wind tunnel must be incredibly smooth and consistent to get consistent results. On top of that, there's also the fact that no matter how hard you try, it's often impossible to replicate the exact conditions they're experiencing out in the real world. The aerodynamics of the actual wind tunnel design are crucial too, and must be perfect before any testing can be conducted. That's because turbulence or disruptions in the airflow caused by the design will compromise the test results, rendering the wind tunnel completely useless. Now, broadly speaking, wind tunnel designs can be split into two different methods open return and closed return. An open return design will draw air into the tunnel through a large type of honeycomb mesh and smooth out the airflow before being compressed down into the test section and travelling past the fan before exiting the back tunnel into the back of the building housing it. Closed return tunnels on the other hand work in a similar way but once the air passes through the test section of the tunnel it remains enclosed in that circular or oval design that continues to smooth the airflow before looping that same air back in front of the test section again. This results in a more controlled airflow for more accurate testing conditions. But the vast expenses don't stop at the construction stage because operating a wind tunnel is an ongoing investment. They require absolutely huge amounts of money and huge amounts of power to generate all the airflow necessary for the testing. A recent high-tech facility opened by McLaren Automotive at their HQ in Woking features a 2.2 megawatt fan which can generate wind speeds of up to 180 miles an hour 
and a high-tech rolling road to simulate real-world conditions even further. Now, to put 2.2 megawatts into context, is 2,200,000 watts. And if you were to combine the watts of over 15,000 average cyclists, you could just about power the fan for one hour of testing. The cost of electricity alone is close to £1,000 an hour. And while as cyclists, we don't need wind tunnels that are quite as advanced or powerful as what's used in the automotive world, the cost and power required is still huge. On top of all of that, the people involved in wind tunnel operations are highly skilled professionals, ranging from aerodynamicists to technicians, and each plays a crucial role in conducting accurate tests and interpreting the data. How wind tunnels are utilised will vary between different industries, but there's always the same end goal of optimising aerodynamics to give a competitive advantage. In the cycling world, wind tunnels are used to test various bike designs, rider positions and clothing designs, and different equipment configurations, each with the end goal of improving aerodynamics. This would mean a cyclist can travel faster at a given power, or means less power is required to ride at a certain speed. Aerodynamic drag is generated by the rider's body, and that's the greatest factor to overcome, which is why pro riders will often spend hundreds and hundreds of hours in the wind tunnel trying to make them as fast as possible. Aerodynamic drag is measured in CDA, which consists of two different factors. The drag coefficient of the object being tested, the CD part, and the frontal area, the A part. The lower the CDA number, the better. A regular road cyclist would expect to have a CDA of 0.35 to 0.4. A time trial specialist, closer to 0.2. Now, a reduction of 0.01 from your CDA should, broadly speaking, require about 10 watts less power to ride at the same speed. Formula One teams, on the other hand, utilize wind tunnels to fine tune the speed and grip of their cars. Every curve, angle, and surface meticulously analyzed to enhance downforce at certain speed and certain wind angles. It's kind of like the opposite effect of what's used to generate lift for aeroplanes. The designs of the car use airflow to force it into the ground, vastly increasing tyre grip and corner speeds. The trade-off for all this downforce, though, is a lower top speed on the straights, and it's finding that perfect balance between speed and downforce that is the key to success. The data collected through wind tunnel testing is invaluable for engineers. It provides information that's going to influence the design decisions and help manufacturers to stay ahead of their competition. Now, in terms of how wind tunnel actually works, well, for starters, modern wind tunnels actually draw air past the test object rather than blowing air at them, like the first wind tunnel back in 1871. The test section is where the exciting part happens. Now, in terms of testing a cyclist, the bike, either with or without the rider, depending on the type of testing that you're doing, is placed onto a special jig, which holds the bike very still and allows the wheels to still rotate. This part is often referred to as the balance and is absolutely crucial in measuring and getting accurate data. It's carefully calibrated and then zero to register the force applied with zero wind speed. Now, as the fan draws air through the test section and over the rider, the balance accurately records the force that's applied to it as the wind speed increases. The higher the aerodynamic drag, the greater the force which is measured. Cameras also monitor the rider's position and then calculate the frontal area, which in turn gives you that magic CDA number. The lower the number, the faster the setup. Testing like this is only really looking at the aerodynamics with the wind direction head on to the rider, whereas out in the real world, that wind direction is regularly changing. And the wind angle relative to the riding and direction of travel is called yaw and it's measured in degrees. It has a big impact on the aerodynamics and performance of a bike and the rider, and it's one of the complexities designers and manufacturers have to overcome. Because out in the real world, the time that a cyclist spends riding at zero degrees yaw is relatively small, when the majority of modern wind tunnels can actually account for this by rotating the platform to place the rider at different angles and see how the wind speed is affected at those angles. This is one of the main reasons we've seen carbon wheel and frame design move away from a sharp V-shape to a more rounded U-shape profile that offers an advantage over a wider range of conditions. While wind tunnels undoubtedly come with a mind-blowing price tag, their role in advancing aerodynamic research and enhancing performance across various industries simply cannot be overlooked. These facilities are at the forefront of innovation, pushing the boundaries of what's possible in the world of aerodynamics. There is, however, one huge problem which every single person has to overcome, and that 
is the governing bodies who set the rules for the relative sports. Now here in the world of cycling, we have the UCI. Now some people argue that the UCI's rules are holding back evolution and bike development, whereas others will argue that the rules are doing a great job at preserving the history and heritage of the sport stopping it from deviating away from its origins. Now, you can share your thoughts on this in the comments section down below because, well, as always, a healthy debate is very welcome. Now, I hope you enjoyed taking a closer look at the fascinating world of wind tunnels. And if you have enjoyed this video and you want to help support what we do, click that like button and consider subscribing to support our channel. Right, love you, bye.